those of you who have m I have not met, my name's Felice Bell. I'm one of the adjunct professors. <laughs> Um, this is my first day of this year's residency, so I see some new faces. Welcome, I can't wait to meet you and get to know you and your writing. So we have an awesome afternoon for you. We're going to start with a musical performance by our very own Katie Turner. And then we're going to turn it over. Oh yeah, definitely. We got a preview at lunch, I'm super excited. Um, and then we'll have our featured guest, Adam Faulkner, who will read from his new collection called The Lilies and we'll have a brief conversation with him. So about Katie, Katie Turner is a New York transplant from Austin. She is a lyricist, poet, and hopeful fiction writer. She expresses herself through song and verse. She's overjoyed to be a part of the St. Francis Creative Writing Program, and she looks forward to growing as a writer and a human being in the upcoming residency. Now, if you love what you hear, and you will, um, Katie is performing on January 20th at 7 p.m. at the Galancy, so we will see you all there. Please, a rousing round of applause for Katie Turner. Thank you, Felice. I'm really excited to hear Adam's poetry. I'm gonna play two songs for you guys. They're both originals. Um, this one is a blues song and sort of a writing exercise. It's called Dead Man Walking. Hope you enjoy. talking to an abusive ex, um, but when I wrote it, I was sort of writing it to myself, like to my past self. Um, yeah, that's secret little context, hope you guys <laughs> enjoy. <laughs> Pretty bruises. I sent my own beloved book down the long and winding road. She never had the time to hear me. Look around, look around, do you see anybody by your side? 
Come on. Do you take pride in knowing that I got used to pretty bruises on my skin? Finger digging in. strategist. He's the author of the 2017 chapbook, Adoption. You may have seen or read his work on HBO, NBC, NPR, the New York Times, you know, just the usual. <laughs> He's a former high school English teacher and the founder and executive director of the pioneering diversity consulting initiative, the Dialogue Arts Project. He is also special projects coordinator for Urban Word, NYC. He was a featured performer at, the, at President Obama's <laughs> Grassroots Ball in 2019, and he holds a PhD in education and English from Columbia University. So all of that is amazing, right? Like the credentials are good. <laughs> I will say this. <laughs> I have known Adam <laughs> peripherally, right, three, for years. Um, and I feel like the, the work is there, the technique is there, the craft is there. What I want to say most is that his writing has always, for me, had so much heart. And I feel like that's a thing you can't fake. And so I'm so excited that he's here with us today at St. Francis. So please welcome Adam Faulkner. <laughs> literacy in the world. Um, they are how I learned to read. They are what made me think school wasn't for nerds. They made me think that my life was academic subject matter worthy of interrogating because it took a teacher that allowed music to enter their classrooms. And it's one of the reasons I take up education so seriously. So I'm always really appreciative whenever music enters the space. I'm often, I mean, I'm without words at what a gift that was. Thank you. That was really beautiful. <laughs> Um, I'm also going to try and 
take a note from Katie and just continue to uh, open the space up with a little bit of song, if that's okay. Um, I am going to need your help, though, before we do that. Is that okay? Yeah. Right. Listen. Let's get something out of the way real, real quickly here. <laughs> this is a dialogic opportunity. Less me standing in front of you, talking at you like I have the right to do so or more information than you. Um, if there are opportunities for you to speak or speak back to something you feel or experience, then I hope you take that opportunity to do so. But we're gonna go ahead and get all of the like awkwardness out the way uh, and, and, and start with an exercise that forces you to do that with me in song. Are you okay with that? Sure, yeah. Yeah. Great. we are getting there. All right. That's the way. Um, it, all you need to know is one word, and the one word is yeah. That is a word that you know, right? Yeah. yeah. Quick learners, here we go. If you're all right, say yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> If you're all right, say yeah. 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 Okay, I'm getting a lot of energy from this section. <laughs> Up over here, there's a decided vacancy in the center of the room. I'm not gonna like make uncomfortable eye contact with anybody. Uh, but the point is not how you sound. The point is that you're heard. Okay. If you're all right, say yeah. 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 Better. There are two places you can actually sing from. One of them is this part. It's your like, like Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, like straining. It's the veins are popping out of your neck part. And then the other part is. Does anybody know what the other part we sing from is? Diaphragm. Exactly. People in the back are like, I don't even know what it is, but it's this. It's, it's like down here. It's like the guttural. Right. It's down here. That's what we're going for. This is like a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday situation. <laughs> If you're all right, say yeah. 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 And if you're all right, say yeah. 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 Better. If you're all right, say yeah. 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 And if you're all right, say yeah. Yeah. Say yeah. 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 Look on either side of you real quick. <laughs> Just check out who's sitting around you. So now you know the face of the person refusing to participate in this activity. All right, I will leave a public accountability. If you're all right, say yeah. Yeah. And if you're all right, say yeah. Say yeah. Say yeah. Yeah. I just want to pray. And I just do want to pray yeah. for you. And I just do want to pray yeah. My father is a mansion. My father is my father he is, my father he is, a mansion, and he has, and he has, many rooms, many rooms. My father is a mansion made entirely of myths. Each vaulted ceiling more elaborate than the last. My father is a trophy in a flock of empty frames. Fork in the most violent of rivers. He is detective, therapist, sax player, a nobody. He is a water walker whose mouth spills story like night moths. He is both arms around me like the sky of a bomb blast, storm of a thousand swallowed keys, candle in a cave without an entrance. His wine glass sloshes into his lap at red lights. He is the empty groove in a mattress, racket of hard back dickens through drywall. He helps people fish inside themselves for the right lies. He is other women's names and locked cabinets. One eye cast over his shoulder for shrapnel. He is vomit 
on the carpet of every room in the home I grew up in. Scholar of bomb blast, both arms around me, he is legend. Made of mitts and keys and red lights and other women. Pile of snip strings and snot in a rehab waiting room. He is a hard back water walker. He is a fishing tail. He is an elaborate entrance. two, three weeks, and I'm extremely excited to have this particular collection out there in the world. It contains a lot of life and a lot of really important narratives that I've been working on in my life for the better part of a decade. Some things we write span like a moment we spent in the grocery store and we get 150 pages out of it. Um, this particular thing spans like 10 years of trying and failing and finally getting it right and repairing relationships with people I love. And I think we're lucky when we have something like come out that represents us, that, that takes up a span of our life like that. So I'm really privileged and excited to, to share and read from it. Um, and I'm excited to have it out there in the world. Uh, the other thing I wanna do is, I really do wanna treat this like a conversation. Um, I, know, I know precisely where I am. I, I live in Fort Greene, I am a English teacher by trade, and uh, I travel around the country, and I talk with many, 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 many people like yourselves who are smarter than I am about craft and about the world and what it means to pick up a pen and write at a time when we're terrified for most of the people we love. Um, so I also want to treat this like a conversation. And if you have questions about craft, cool. If you have questions about me or, or things that you're thinking about or wrestling with or playing with, I'd really like to treat this as like open and conversationally as possible. Um, so I'll read a few poems from the book, talk a little bit about the sort of narratives and the architecture of this thing, and then, um, and then we'll see if you've got questions, okay? Any questions so far? Okay, cool. <laughs> would've, been, would've been fun. <laughs> um, so this book uh, is called The Willies. And uh, it's, it's really telling two stories simultaneously. The first um, is the story that I sort of hinted at um, briefly in that first piece, which is my father um, and his relationship to substances and his um, sort of devolvation or his like um, unraveling into substance abuse about 10 years ago. And uh, the parallel narrative of my choosing to come out in the world alongside watching his uninvestigated life um, and him potentially drink himself to death. Uh, and I decided to like investigate some of the stories in my own life that were unchecked. Um, and one of those was like being a 22 year old queer man and not having the courage at the moment in my life to like name what I felt. Um, so the reason it's called the willies is because there are those two narratives sort of paralleling each other side by side this entire time. Um, my father is sort of like sinking into this space of addiction and my clawing toward a light that I didn't quite know what it was, but trying to do the hard internal work um, toward naming it. There are lots of costumes that we try on when we're not sure who we want to be or when we are hiding. Um, the willies that my father donned for like 45, 60 almost years of his life were trying to disguise and hide an addiction. Um, the willies that I donned or costumed in or paraded around in were anything that I could do to present as queer or gay. And a lot of that has to do with some of the, the stories I'll share um, here. This poem is called Willy Boy. Finally, the poem I will not write. I am in fifth grade wrestling in a brush pile of dead leaves with a now dead friend. We paw the hardening knots in each other's gym shorts, laugh and writhe until the leaf pile is no longer a pile but a kicked in hive of teeny heaving lungs. Soft stink of new sweat and rotting wood. 
Six girlfriends and a dissertation later, I wake up in a tougher city with new friends who remind me of my father. I look at men with chiseled jaws on loud trains, or rather, in old ways, but with less at stake. Wonder if they ever hover their gaze over me for an instant too long, too. If the flexed tricep peeking from under my own black t-shirt makes them dance their eyes into pretend reading material, too. I freeze snapshots of beautiful strangers and pin them in the high ceiling hallways inside me, near the faces of everyone who knows me by a different town and a different version of my father, none of which are the Christmas he got loaded and started yelling about how gay people give him the willies rooted in Willy Boy, or Sissy, a name I've tried fighting and drinking and fucking away since sixth grade, a badge I've buried amidst the brass edges of ball fields and rap songs, and still here, beneath the goose down of this new bearded man, soft snore into my t-shirt and his right teacup, hairy thigh laid heavy across my lap, I peck the first lines of a poem I will not finish, another Willy. A sissy, it raises its hand and draws a blank, swells its chest, coughs soot, curls its fists, slinks into the night. Thank you. The trouble with reading from a new book is that you just start kind of like, you forget what shit is inside the book. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought that was like such a trap that people would say, like, oh, I mean, it's like, did you really not prepare for this? No, it's like, I did, but uh, now they're on pages that I don't recall. <laughs> <clears throat> um, I'm gonna read a string of these pieces uh, quickly, and um, I can just run right into them. I'm gonna read them all at once. They're all chunks, um, and, and the first line of each stanza or piece is, uh, is the title. So I'll just sort of like raise my hand when I'm saying the title, and we'll just push through it. Let's get one thing halfway straight. I have spent my entire life trying on costumes because no one told me I couldn't and the stakes were not that high which I have come to think is mostly what makes a white writer a white writer. The last time anyone referred to me by that name was exactly never, but that is also the point, yes? <laughs> I am a queer poet. I am a child of an addict. I am a masquerading white boy. My best friend died and it was sad, and these are the stories I water into bloom. Camp counselor, test sheet, choir boy, cipher rapper, scratch golfer, honor roll, pothead, point guard. And Whitman says, well, you contain multitudes, but Whitman was a white writer too. And the not so funny thing about spending a life proving you aren't something is that any story that isn't the story is survival. And it's more like a brick for laying until the wall is high enough that you're safe inside and you wake up and say, whoops, whose house is this? Who did I hurt to get here? And is it too late to call for help? His name was Eduardo. And I only did him for Ariel and like three other people and only when they asked, usually our favorite last seat on the school bus. Eduardo was an enterprising young hairdresser from Miami with a heavy lift and limp wrists and big hair, which I'd always have one hand on, maybe pulling it back or wrapping a towel around or tucking rollers into or misting with spray. I imagined him in skinny tracksuit polyester with jewelry like my grandmother's that rattled when you waved, plus rings on his fingers that clinked against the cans. The point is I made people laugh, 
We had boyfriends all over South Beach who knew about each other and that got us in trouble, but that was funny too because of sex. And I was one of the last stops on the route, so sometimes Eduardo and I got to strut down the bus aisle together and wave goodbye to all of the empty seats. It's tricky, so stay with me. I crushed on the girls who dated the boys I crushed on, <laughs> which I understand seems inefficient, <laughs> but really it did the job. <laughs> I loved Jeff, or at least from my desk behind him in third period, like imagining my palms slapped around the buzzed cowlick on his neck, and Jeff asked Tasha to a dance, which I knew to mean that Tasha and I should hook up. It is not that complicated if you think about it. <laughs> I loved Evan, or at least the way pool water clung to his trunks and his thigh hairs when he climbed out of the chlorine, and he got head from Michelle Cantor that summer behind the equipment shed, so I gave her my virginity. We thrashed around in the dead darkness of a linen closet. Our bones clacked against the wood floor until there really wasn't much else to say. Hmm. Um, I, I talk often about uh, issues of whiteness uh, and race, particularly from like an academic side of things. I talk a lot about white teachers and white teachers that choose to pick up the craft and, and pedagogy of standing in classrooms and, and telling people uh, how to be or how to pursue their own lives. Um, and one of the ways that I, in part from personal experience, but also because I think it is a really profound writing prompt. Uh, one of the ways that I take up that exercise uh, through poetry is through inventory and cultural appropriation uh, and the ways in which like whiteness is just an insatiable fucking monster that puts its name on things. And it's easiest for me to talk about that um, through the lens of, of many of my own experiences. So a lot of the like costumes that I sort of parade around in in the context of these pages um, are about a, a, a version of a younger self, but they're also about a version of um, people I've spent my entire life around, um, loving and, uh, and, and loathing. I'll read one more uh, of these little ones, and then uh, I'll read one of those white pieces. Joey from Dawson's Creek was my beard. <laughs> Y'all know Dawson's Creek, right? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, it's funny, right? Sometimes you read this to high school students, and they're like, what? <laughs> Pacey, come oh on, Pacey. <laughs> Rep, Pacey, exactly. Yeah. Which is why Joey from Dawson's Creek was my beard. Which, if you don't know, means she was my prom date. My monster truck, my main squeeze rumor squatter. All I had to do was leave the locker ajar for her scotch taped image to yell to all of B Hall. There was nothing to see here at all, just Joey at the end of a dock. Joey in a field of daisies. Joey and Bobby make up ads and stepping onto a red carpet. Obviously, this is the gayest thing ever, but let me get to the point. <laughs> Joey was not real, except she taught me how simple it was to hide in a look and a laugh or to hold hands at the back of a bus and kiss in the smoky, funked out basements of parties and on the hoods of cars and stadium parking lots, or for how to say faggot and how to avoid the boys whose air I could feel come off them and toward me when they walked. Another way of saying this is, Jesus, I am just so sorry because there were so many and I did not even watch that show. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I think I can do this one from memory. Mahogany would shame me if I can't. Owning your own white guilt is not cool yet. So you stuff the soft parts of other kids' cultures into your pockets until you believe that it is not there at all. You are a matching sweatsuit jukebox stock with everything from Ice Cube to Outkast. Entire albums memorized and coiled in the damp of your throat, they are gunfire into the air above the school parking lot. And that, well, that is as black as you think possible. And pulling blunts the size of magic markers into your small lungs before school 
is black. Your dance routines are black. They call you Justin Timberlake. Your crossover is the blackest, but you are the only white boy on the court anyway. They call you Steve Kerr. You used to stare at a freckle on your left arm and imagine your entire body that color. How much easier it might be to be you if that were the case. And until someone tells you otherwise, that is black too. Of course, sorry, I'm hugging. <laughs> <laughs> it isn't that you don't know you're white. Less white is all you really like to be. You're sure there are good parts about having white skin too, even if you cannot see them yet. Because no one asks you where you came from or how you got right here, which is good because you probably could not answer anyhow. You just whoosh, appear with an insatiable hunger to touch things that do not belong to you in a culture that fits like a bed sheet. No one told you that you can't place your favorite things about black people into a single bucket and just try them on to feel better about something, and so you do just that. You dip your toe in, and out, you run when you must, but you stay when you choose. And that part, the choosing, is the whitest thing. Sort of meandering throughout this book uh, is me chronicling the sort of general levels of, uh, <coughs> it's chronicling my timeline as like a, a, a white young person in America, not horribly dissimilar from the one just described in that poem, in an unnamed town in the great Midwestern part of these United States. Um, but I do that through the lens of specific album drops, right? Where I was at in my level of white boy dumb when the Wu-Tang came out, and then when the Blueprint came out, and then when the Chronic came out, all the way up until like the late 2010s or so. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that is sort of one of the sort of like oscillating costuming or parading pieces. Uh, any questions? Curiosities, feelings about the state of the world. I know that's, that's a soft pitch. <laughs> yeah. When did you come to the like what piece you just spoke in regards to whiteness? Mm -hmm. What age were you? Do you remember like paying attention to that and noticing like, oh crap, this is actually wrong? What, as far as like, yeah. where did that? Because you know, for the most part, when you're young, you don't know. Yeah. And then at some point, when you get older, you think about it and you yeah. start educating yourself, or you mm -hmm. maybe have friends who may have let you know things. Yeah. How, when did you come to that realization? I think. Uh, I mean, I, I can read that poem. Uh, if 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 you like, um, I would be. You know, I, I think a big part of. It was college, generally speaking, right? It was the opportunity where I first had to sort of like mask as like a high school student what was just clearly um, misguided uh, fear and anxiety about access that I had, right? For me, when I was like 15 years old, the opposite of whiteness is, was blackness. The opposite of whiteness is dismantling whiteness. Right, and I, at that moment, did not have like a critical enough toolkit to try and interrogate why I felt the way I did. So the, the ways that I went about navigating that anxiety was just by surrounding myself with things that didn't, for me, feel white. When I got to college, because school was important to me, um, got to college, I, uh, I was lucky enough to have a professor who sat me down and said, what the literal fuck are you doing? In, in a way that drew me into the conversation as opposed to alienated me from it. Um, and from that point forward, uh, I, I, I just started writing and, and learning everything I possibly could about, um, 
about whiteness and what it meant to like be white in, in America, which is a horrifying thing to create an independent concentration as a college student about. Um, but a, a simpler answer is that um, someone corrected me. And that someone, and the someones often in cases like these are not white people, right? So like my self-actualization to some degree, coming to an extent of better understanding myself, uh, was because a really powerful woman of color whose class I was fortunate enough to sit in walked me to myself and said, you have the opportunity to do this uh, or you can continue to parade around this campus and do whatever you think you need to do in order to feel better about your shame. Um, part of that experience for me and part of why I have taken up education uh, is to talk to white people, um, particularly white teachers, particularly white teachers going into spaces and classrooms populated by largely black and brown young people, asking them to think carefully about why they're doing the work they're doing um, and what permanent savior complexes white people seem to carry in spaces of sociology and academia. Um, but so I just gave you the answer that is like one of the, the pieces in this book. Um, but I don't know if it's more than you bargained for. <laughs> yeah. OK, yeah, thank you. Um, and you know, if we're being honest, like I think, I think that's part of one of the, eventually, I don't think I knew it at the time, but uh, that's part of the like academic curiosity about whiteness allowed me to uh, hide from a, a larger silence in my life, which is the other like 40% of this book, right? Which is being terrified of gender and masculinity and queerness as I saw my father's life like crumbling right in front of me. It was like, whew, as long as I'm over here like interrogating race and patting myself on the back for that shit, I don't have to think at all about issues of toxic masculinity and homophobia literally in my family or, <laughs> heaven forbid, the fact that I might be gay, right? Um, and I, I think that that's one, of the, that's one of the things I'm trying to like pull at in terms of connective tissue between these poems, um, is that it's really, really easy for us to convince ourselves that we are doing the holistic work <laughs> in the world, whether it's for ourselves or for other people, um, when this is a constant relearning and reinvention of self every couple weeks, every couple months, every couple years. Uh, all right, um, I'll read a couple more and then let's take some questions. If you've got questions, great, hold on to them. If you don't have questions, get a fucking question. <laughs> Just kidding, consider a question. Uh, all right, um, so I'll read a couple more pieces uh, about, about my father. Um, this piece is called, well, I'll give you a um, little, little pep talk before. If you've ever had someone in your life, my grandma a couple years ago uh, passed away on my dad's side who was old, you know, he was like 90, 89 years old, which is a long, rich, fruitful, privileged life to live. Um, but toward the end, she started to kind of lose it. And if you've ever been in a situation where you are watching someone age, uh, you don't know what gr aging graceful looks like until you watch someone who just like doesn't quite have all their faculties toward the, toward the end, right? And sitting beside her, we would check in. You know, she was hospitalized for the last like year or two of her life. And sometimes she would remember who we were and sometimes she would not. And at some point, that's not, if it's alarming at first, but once that becomes part of the habitual pattern of how someone is staying alive, they're just like taking inventory of the corridors of all the people they've met and you're one of them, you know? And if you want to be like, where am I? I'm not so-and-so, I'm so-and-so. Like, that's more about you than it is her. So you just kind of like show up and be present for them. But I walked in there once with my dad, right toward the end, like a few days before she died, and she called me Barack. <laughs> and if your politics are anything like mine at this point, uh, if someone calls you Barack Obama, and they th legitimately believe that you are Barack Obama, You might roll with that for a second, right? Um, <laughs> every time I tell a story, I feel like such an awful person, but it's okay, you know, hey. Tell me if someone calls you Mr. President, you'll be like, oh, I'm not. 
yes, how can I help you? <laughs> My grandma calls me Barack, asks me by her bedside how I'm enjoying the White House, how that pretty Michelle is doing, and if I've been able to get any sleep. She says she's ready to go home. Just unplug the spaghetti. She smells the meds in her milkshake from a mile away. No goody goo for me. No moxes for this foxes. No tricks in for this Nixon. I tell her the White House is fine, but it is a lot of responsibility. I'm going completely gray, as you've probably seen. She clicks her molars softly to mirror the rain outside. Her eyes a glazy gristle jumping from TV to window to ceiling. All those rooms, she sighs. You must get lost. And I tell her that I do almost daily. It is hard to remember who I am sometimes. This healthcare business, this whole gay marriage thing, these men on magazine covers diving into one another. And then her eyes stop skimming the room. They settle on the bottom of the eighth inning in the corner. She calls me Mark, calls me Aaron. She squints and points a lone bony finger in my direction, skin slipping from both sides like a wet dish rag draped over an oven handle. And calls me nothing. <laughs> When I say that he is a good-looking man, I mean that objectively. As in anyone who thinks otherwise might be so homophobic that they themselves are gay and I am not gay, therefore I appreciate how others might be drawn to certain features that he holds. <laughs> now, when I say I find him handsome, again, I would like to clarify that statement. I think of him as beautiful in that girls love him sort of way. How, if I were a girl, I might wait outside his dressing room too. I might write him letters as well. However, I am not, so I won't, but I'm saying I get it. <laughs> and even this, said aloud in this very room, a flag javelined deeper into the cocksure certainty of my own Budweiser. So straight, that is, that I can say I think about his stubble against my neck without your thinking this poem is about to get gay as hell. <laughs> that glorious scrape and push of dueling jawlines. How I spend my morning commute on the two train wondering how our college soccer hips might feel cutting into one another in a corner on the hood of some car in a neighborhood I do not live in, where no one knows me outside the splintered park bench, these rolled up jeans and tired black t-shirts. This orange magic hour on the East River, hairy tattooed arm laid lazy around my neck like a hitching post, a giddy ribbon unravels inside me each time he cups my face in his palms. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, how y'all feeling? Good? Great. Questions? Ideas? Thoughts? Considerations? Yeah. What's your relationship like with Ludo? <laughs> Say more. <laughs> Say more? Yeah. Oh, it was just more pointing you in directions of just accepting you for the form. Mm -hmm. uh, how to use it or don't use it. Yeah. As opposed to wondering what, like, if you ever use it or. Yeah, I do. I mean, I, it is important to me. Uh, it is important to me how things sound. Um, and that is probably my like chief editing tool when I am writing, right? Like if I'm just writing things and they appear on the page, um, and it, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily matter if it's, if it's poetry, right? This is true of essays that I write. This is true of short stories. This is true of academic papers. Like if it doesn't sound good um, in terms of the rhythm and the meter in it um, and the pacing, then I just sort of like throw it out the window, right? But that is my first and like most trusted companion. Uh, I'm, I'm constantly writing while my mouth is moving. Um, and that's an important piece for me. Um, 
but I'll also say that I, I really appreciate uh, restriction around um, my work because I come from a school of writing that um, obviously privileges free verse and free form um, and playing with the way that things appear and function on page, both in terms of like margin um, and, uh, and space, right? But I, I really often uh, gravitate toward instructions that place parameters around meter and place parameters around form because it's, it's in those things that I, I tend to find a little bit more freedom. Um, and I think it's a, a telling question for a musician to ask that because I often find, right, um, I'm also a songwriter and it, I, I find the process of writing song lyrics um, so much more freeing. I mean, I'm not as good at it, right? I'm just, I'm not. So I've tried it, it's, I'm fine, I'm okay at it. Um, but I find it freeing because I can't, I can't sit in the darkness and just like yowl over how many words are going to fit on this page, right? In free form, or I'm, it's I am my own worst enemy when I'm just left to like write as much until I'm exhausted and I abandon it, right? No, no poems for me are finished. They're just abandoned. I get up and I walk away and I'm like, this will do. Um, but when I'm working in a form structure, whether it's like songwriting or whether it is poetic structure, I write increasingly a lot of pantoums, uh, sonnets are my friend, um, villanelles are hard as fuck, but I like them. Um, big fan of the bop. <laughs> um, I find liberation in them because it forces me to get out of my own way and it, it forces me to focus more on um, the word economy and in so doing, the value of the things that I'm saying and the beauty of the words. All right. It's a long answer, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's go one and then one and then two. Yeah, no, you're good. Sure. Yeah, one time. Sure. Totally. And then two, given your work in being a bridge of understanding and reflection for uh, white queers, mm. and, and having that as an especially observer in your history, mm -hmm. how do you help them do so? Yep. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Excellent question. Um, I appreciate the safety in air quotes, too, <laughs> right? Especially in education spaces. We're like, safe space and we like throw a poster on the wall and we're like everybody good any questions <laughs> no safe is no space is safe um a lot of the way that i might approach those questions is actually from the sort of pedagogical space right encouraging other young writers to tell their stories um because i don't i don't know necessarily I know that I wrote my way out of the closet, and I knew that I wrote ahead of my lived life. And I emerged from a school that, that kind of privileged that, right? It privileged the write about write hard and fast um, about something that hurts. It became clear to me in that school, and, and specifically I'm talking about like performance poetry and like uh, slam spaces where there's like a trauma and a vulnerability metric, and we're literally attaching scores to that shit, right? The harder you cry and the harder it hurts, the further you're gonna go in this shitty tournament that has a fake ceiling that isn't gonna mean anything, right? It's real. Uh, as someone who came from that school and continues to participate in it, like, slam is trash. Um, 
but I, but I know that, that I borrowed from that a kind of like urgency about telling a truth. I just didn't know necessarily what that truth was. Um, and I, I don't think that I like traumatized myself. I think I was, uh, I was challenged to write around what my actual hurt was because there was a currency attached to a certain kind of pain in those spaces, right? Um, so I was writing, when I was 17, 18, I was writing stories that I recognized had a kind of currency on a stage that were like adjacently mine, but certainly not the story I needed to be telling. And in that sense, there was a larger and longer trauma for me to unlearn as a writer and a creator about what it means to write honestly, right? Um, but I, I do think that when the time came for me to really sit with myself, and that was watching you know, my, my father's life start to unravel, uh, it, it was important for me to really ask myself, what are the stories that I, that I do need to tell? Free of craft, um, really free of craft. I'm, I'm called often to like Audre Lorde's uh, essays on the, the need to articulate without craft. And that's a lot of the, I think of that as being a, the way that I have replaced write it hard and fast about something that hurts. You can do that if you want. I do not encourage young people to do that. I encourage young people to write about whatever the fuck feels good. And if it feels good for you to like interrogate and mine yourself because there's power in telling a story that you think is underrepresented out there in the world, then do that. But if it gives you anxiety or it scares you to return to a place, don't write about it. Don't write about it, don't read it, don't share it. Um, there's an entire subset of fields dedicated to picking up your pain, none of which are creative writing teachers. And I don't think that we should be placing pain as a currency in spaces where we're trying to get kids to get grades and walk up on stages. As it pertains to white kids and the work I try and do with them, um, it's easy when I spot me, right? It's much easier when I see a young person who's clearly anxious. I like know the symptoms of young people who like are trying to do good in the world, but are just kind of shitty because there are not very many strong holistic examples of white cis-bodied dudes out there doing meaningful work. Um, and that for me, I, I have a set of tools around, right? Um, the key for me in, in working with uh, a lot of white students uh, is not necessarily about writing in particular, it's about dialogue. It's about um, getting them to articulate how they feel. It's getting them closer in touch with their like emotional interior lives, um, you know, which <laughs> is a blade that cuts both ways. But that's why we need affinity spaces for white kids to just talk to white kids. <laughs> um, so I don't know if that answers your question. I'm happy if that if that comes from a space of uh, you want some tricks and, and ideas, I'm happy to share a lot of those things. Um, as a white teacher, I'm often most conscious about not reinforcing the dynamic that my identity brings into spaces, even, even if they are largely white spaces. I think it's important in largely white spaces for white people to diminish the impact of their voices. And I think the younger we can teach teenagers and undergraduates how to do that, um, the better. Decentering ourselves is like step negative seven. <laughs> Great question. Did I answer them? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and then another one in the back. Um, Hi. Sure, sure. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Yeah, no, I, I think a lot of it makes sense. Um, could I, could I maybe ask for just the last part to be rephrased? Because I think that's the part that has the most meat for me, and I want to respond to it. Yeah. I think what I want to know is how you arrive at that sound for mm. particular meter. Yep. Yep. Mm. And analyzing at that recognizes the kind of tradition that I saw with Mariah and calling it about the African American mm -hmm. and how that relates to mm -hmm. the proximity and the influence of white. Mm. Sure. I mean, I think, um, first of all, it's a great question. I appreciate you bringing it into the space. Thank you. Um, and am I, am I all right? I mean, I want to. I wanna, speak to it specifically, but am I also okay in, in inviting the space to, to speak back to that in as much as you offered it to the room? Cool. Um, you know, I think uh, to some extent, my life is a process of unlearning how I can and cannot take up space. Um, and that changes depending on the various tasks before me in the various rooms that I'm working in, right? Um, I think that I have particularly, and this is, this is an honest answer. This is as honest as I could be right now. I'm really trying to like, I'm not dressing it in so much as I'm thinking critically and trying to say the right words to you. Um, I think that I have tried, uh, which is why I read the whiteness poems less right now. I prefer th for them to sit on the page because I often find that in the writing process for me, when I write about whiteness, I am more honest than my body and my voice allow me to be when I am trying to present a version of myself in public. When I write critically about whiteness and detach the learned muscles and behaviors of growing up in spaces uh, often where I was a, a not one of the only white voices, um, and I, I think I wrestle a lot with that. And if one of the questions is, um, from a critical space of does it feel problematic for me to open uh, a reading or a space with a call to community, um, I can give that a lot of thought. And I, I, will, I will take that to heart. But I, uh, I think that what you're naming is something that's probably true, is that what comes out in the body and what comes out in the sort of l language and the way that I've learned to put words in my mouth in front of groups of people, particularly when I am conscious about my whiteness and trying to appear less like the white dude I hope you don't think I am, yes? 
uh, that, that is what happens to me. Um, and frankly, I mean, there's, I guess there's no way to prove this. Frankly, I see that happen to myself in, in my body in white spaces as well. Where I am talking about whiteness and bringing it into a room, it is hard for me to do that. And I don't think it's a, a conscious choice, but it is hard for me to do that without trying to, or without falling back onto learned behaviors that are in the sort of like muscular architecture of my body that at once made me feel less white that I have been spending the next 20 years of my life trying to unlearn. Um, sure, great question. Great question. Yeah? Yes, he has. Um, he, I mean, I think I labored over that for a while. Um, and I haven't read a ton of my, the, da the dad poems in here. It's, like, it's a lot of other, other stuff. Maybe I'll close with one about him. Um, but I'm a big believer of like, you, you write what you need to write. And um, he'll, f he'll find it or he won't, you know. Um, but those were stories that like I had to tell for me, about me. Uh, I think that the emotional truth is the truth. Um, and that, because like always what happens when I write about family or friends, in as much as we try and like rename them or move circumstances, like I know and like my dad knows, um, how I experienced a thing is how I experienced a thing, right? Um, and a lot of my labor as a writer and as a, as a teacher just unpacking things uh, in my own like, life has been trying to take inventory of what emotional truths I just sort of like batted away. Because how you remember something happening maybe 10 years ago, maybe five years ago, maybe last year, maybe last week in a fight you got in with a partner, um, how, you ex how you remember it is way less significant than how that felt and how you recall it feeling. Because if it felt that way, that's a thing that happened <laughs> for you. Um, not saying who, who's to say we should have or shouldn't have felt X, but I felt it. Um, and I think of that as like a really powerful way to uh, write about people I love, um, caringly and kindly. I also think of it as a really powerful communication tool with my partner and in relationships that I'm like building. It's like whether that was intentional or not, it fucking hurt. I am experiencing this and that is, that is a true statement. This is not a conversation. I experienced X. Um, why do you ask? Do you mind if I ask? I was just wondering your relationship with discovering new ways to meet people like in your childhood. Sure. Uh, I always, I get ahead of it. I let people know particularly if it's like coming out in the world and other people are exposed to it. I think that that's really important. Um, but it's less, a, it's less a are you okay with this and it's more a signal that I've been thinking a lot about this. I worked on this really, really, really difficult work and uh, I love you. Here it is. <laughs> Totally. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I and I I think for me, it's an exercise in like prioritizing other people's comfort, right? Like one of my favorite book titles ever is my friend Morgan has a book called Other People's Comfort Keeps Me Up at Night, which I think is the, the queerest and most <laughs> essential thing about um, the way that I, I lived during this phase of my, my, this book, right? This phase of my life. Um, other people's comfort was more important to me than like my own capacity to heal. 
at the same time, the moment I slip into like, I wrote this thing and I got, you know, like I got you back or like I documented forever the like, whatever, this <laughs> awful four years, like that's dangerous too. Um, because if, if I believe in my ability to change and to heal, then I have to believe in the ability of people who have hurt me to do the same. It's not a, you can't be selective about that. Either you, either you do and you got hope for people to heal or you don't. And I think being direct about what we experience and how we feel in the world uh, is a way that encourages all of us to do that. Good questions. Um, got time for one more? Should we shut it down? Are there other questions, comments? Poem? We could definitely do another poem, yeah. Um, so before I, before I do close out, um, I, I want to invite you all to come to the release to this thing. Um, it is at, it's in Dumbo, at this lovely queer-owned, woman-owned, right under the bridge space called Superfine. If y'all have been there, uh, it's, it's great. They've been there for like 20, 30 years. Um, but uh, it will be a really, really, really dope release. Mahogany L. Brown is hosting it. Uh, and it'll be featuring some pretty awesome guests. And there'll be some great music. And if you come and say that you're from St. Francis, I'll buy you a drink. By which I mean, I'll give you a drink ticket that <laughs> those motherfuckers give to me. <laughs> okay. Um. <laughs> Man. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> it's February 1st. February 1st, Saturday night, um, from 6 to 9 p.m. at Superfine. And you can, we can find each other uh, on, on social or the great wide trap that is the internet <laughs> uh, any number of ways, and we can, we can be in touch that way. Um, thank you, Theo, for, for having. Thank you, Felice. Thank you all for being here. Um, it's, it's rare, actually, to like, be able to, to show up, um, to read poems, and to have a kind of critical conversation in the way that we had. So I really appreciate all the questions. They make me feel a little bit more whole for writing work that's hard, and they make me um, interrogate why I do what I do. It's also been a really, really hard holiday season for me. And it feels really good to just show up and be reminded that like, these are the spaces where my, my life belongs. So this poem, uh, this will be the last joint. It's called Get Well Soon from Riverside Church. It has been 15 years since I last walked into a church and meant it. Sat beneath the gaze of stone saints and prayed for anything other than a new pair of basketball sneakers. But I'm here on my father's birthday, huddled in the last pew with one leg toward the door like someone might catch me, might rattle an icy finger in my direction and remember my name from another life. I, the traitor. I, the walk away. But where else to take these questions of fathers and sons and ghosts that have haunted the holy out of both of you? He, eight states away, speeding to and from his own trial with a wine glass nuzzled in his lap and a family shrinking in the rear view. And I here on a cold day in December, driftwood in this sacred stale cave, wishing I were still in the bed of the man I woke in and courageous enough to tell my father his name. And this, well, this is the great American dad story. This everyone aches to be their father until we grow up and become them story. Until it is we who are hunched over toilet seats, vomit draped from the mouth like a silk scarf, or we who keep silent about the stories we know will save our ticking lives, bury secrets like animal bones until they gulp us whole, we who build and set ablaze our own homes, string together lies like bed sheets from which to repel. But lest this unravel into yet another poem wherein the author pleads genetics, pleads, damn it if it weren't for this booze and this silence, because I am here today.
stealing a moment to hold him up and scared to admit that I might still believe in miracles. The raising of the dead, the turning of water into, well, you get it, that I need to believe he can jump back in the saddle, so stay well, stay with us a while. Happy birthday, Dad. Please keep moving. Please keep breathing. His name is Sean. He would love to meet you. I talk about you all the time.